Good morning, everyone. Lovely to be with you for worship this morning. Uh, we want to say a warm welcome to anyone who is joining us for the first time, and especially on this day as we uh, think about coming together, um, people who are new into Brighton and Sussex area because of university uh, that they're starting at. So we do wish all the students uh, a warm welcome and uh, we hope that we'll get to know them and that some of them will get in touch with our people in our chaplaincies, Dan at Sussex and Cynthia at Brighton and Sue who of course works across them both. But a good morning to you all uh, this day as we come together for worship. Um, join today, I'll be asking if people have uh, maybe got anything that they've made or, or done which has needed them to use instructions. So uh, maybe if you've not seen the email that was asking that, if there's something that you have done, you've made, you've created, you've built or whatever that needs instructions to, to go along with it, maybe you can just think of uh, what those may be. We sent out some sheets, some colouring by numbers sheets, um, because we want to sort of make you follow some instructions today. We know that you're good Methodists and you're always good at following instructions. Hmm. Well, moving on rapidly at this point, uh, we're going to turn then to our first hymn of worship. And our first hymn this morning is Light of the World, number 175 in Singing the Faith, Light of the World. So then let's pray. And so as we come together to worship, we thank you, God, that in Jesus, the Christ shone brightly, the light of the world, for all to see if they, if we would just open our eyes. We praise you, God, at this time of autumn, this change of season which we have felt in the temperature this week, a reminder of your faithfulness, the seasons that turn on season on season, the cycle of life that reminds us that you are creator of all, source of life. As we come to praise you, we ask that we might know our lives touched again by your love, ancient yet ever new. May we open our eyes wider that we may see more clearly the light of Christ in this world. And as we open our eyes to see that light, May our hearts be open and flooded with your love, that they too would come to that place where the Christ light shines and shines into the world. So take our worship, which is the offering of our whole lives to you, our words, our thoughts, our deeds. And may they bring praise and glory to your name. For this we ask in the name of Christ. Amen. So yes, so I wonder um, what things you might have done which uh, you've needed to use instructions for. Uh, I note that John has made a jigsaw puzzle which was supposed to take between five and seven years. Uh, that's a long time to not have a table in use, um, but he made it in 18 months. But John, did that really come with instructions? I mean, on the back of each piece, did it say, this is where you put this piece? I don't know if John wants to answer that or not, but uh, anyway, well, congratulations for doing it, John. Um, certainly give you that. But I wonder if, has anyone got anything they can show us that they've made or, or built or, or got that's full of instructions or that needs instructions? I 
can't see if anyone wants to if anyone wants to say anything please do unmute yourself or put something in the chat box okay. yeah uh, hello andy hello paul this is my lockdown ukulele which i made oh wow um it's actually made from scratch but where i did use instructions was to um do the electronics which are built into the side here Alexander is the electronic genius in the family, so uh, right. I had to rely on <laughs> a few instructions. I can't play it for you, really, because it doesn't make any noise unless you plug it in. Well, it makes it make it perfect. perfect. Yeah, Sue says that makes <laughs> it perfect. <laughs> well, we could hear that. We could hear that. It sounded good. Right. Well, there it is. Solid body. Wow. Well, wow. Well, that's wow. That's well down. <laughs> good. That's good. Um, I know that Pat's begun to make Christmas cards for family and friends. Helps keep her sanity. And I think there's one or two others. People are probably doing that. Karen's learned to make face mask expanders. And also learning to crochet. Um, yes, here, here they are, Andy. Okay, so Karen. I don't really need instructions. Wow, I they're, they're good. I teach myself to crochet, which is a new skill. And, right. Uh, I've uh, been handing them out to like people that work in the chemist and carers and nurses that have been to come and see me. So it takes the pressure off their ears. Oh, that's really nice. And very Thank useful and practical too. That's good. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Andy. We keep, okay. We keep coming to Bob and Sheila, um, which I presume they believe means they've unmuted themselves because they've got something to say. Well, I, I asked Sheila to, to go and get the custard pie that she made yesterday. Because she, she can make it very easily without instructions, but she did check it on a menu that she got. So okay. but she won't go and get it. We're just sitting here. Okay. Well, if you did, you'd probably be eating it, wouldn't you? And that wouldn't be good. No, well, not, we'd make us all jealous. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So that's good. Uh, I certainly need um, not quite instructions to cook cheese on toast, but not far off. Um, David re-editing his uh, his novel Lillian and the Italians, due to be published in on November the thirtieth. So that's great news for you, David. Um, and I, I guess there's all sorts of places you can get to that tell you how to edit books and uh, and write them. So, uh, but that's really good that you've done all of that. Anyone else? We've got a few other people I think have unmuted. Just for all of those good Methodists of you, um, this of course is our Methodist rule book. Some of you will recognize it, the Constitution and Practice and Discipline of the Methodist Church. Um, it's this long. All the ministers know it off by heart. You'll be um, glad to know we don't, um, because what we all do is we turn to the person who does know it off by heart, which is Mick Hickman. Uh, so we're always glad um, that he's been doing that. Um, Heather has um, just told us that she's been transfer instructions on a voltmeter to check the electricity. So uh, I had to check uh, back instructions from her dad in the end, though. So that's good. Okay. So there's quite a few things. Oh, there's a, a picture. I, is that um, a cross stitch? I can't see. It. Is that cross stitch? Yeah, cross stitch. It is. Okay. That's good, and, and certainly um, you kind of have instructions to do that and instructions to follow, a bit like um, colour by numbers, isn't it? I think, but with stitch and um, needles and thread. I'm very well versed in these things, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> Deep Team has been trying to learn how to do tricky bits in Zoom. Yeah, I think we've all been trying to learn how to do tricky bits in Zoom, uh, not least how to remain sane while using Zoom. So all these kind of things are instructions. And sometimes we just need to have instructions because we don't always know how to do things. And if we don't do things right, sometimes they can get quite wrong. So I've got a tent, which I've not put up yet. And it's the weather, I think, is now probably not very much tent weather. But my tent comes with instructions built into the um, into the bag for the tent so I can't lose instructions um, which is probably quite necessary because uh, otherwise when I put it up and I can't put it up in the middle of the night 
I'm going to get wet or soaked. So these things with instructions, they're all very, very useful in all sorts of ways. Um, Nick Ferrell made some cranberry and almond shortbreads, which you definitely needed instructions for. And Nick, I think you probably also definitely need people to taste them to make sure they are okay. Uh, and I will volunteer for that hard job, um, if that's okay. So instructions, they help us. They help us do things right, get the best out of things at times. And, and that too is uh, what's true for us with the Bible, which in some ways is a set of it or contains instructions, but perhaps more often than instructions contains guidelines for the way we live. When we're told to love one another as we are loved by God, then that's a guideline for the ways that we should live. And actually, it would be good for us all and good for the world if we learned to obey and to follow those instructions that we're given. So we're going to sing a song about obeying. Um, this was a new one to me. It's quite catchy. Unfortunately, the words are not on the, uh, the video themselves. So I'm just putting them into the chat box now. So if you do have access to the chat box, you will see the words have come up there. And it goes... Obey, obey, -o, obey, obey, -o, obey, obey, -o, obey the Lord. And then you repeat that. And then the verse goes, we can choose to listen to and obey God. We can choose to follow all his rules. We can choose to do what's right, even when it's hard. O, B, E, Y, we will obey. So obey, obey, -o. and here we go. So um, we're going to move on, but uh, there are sheets which have been sent out with colour by numbers. And if any of you choose to do that, uh, especially there's one which has colour by numbers, but it doesn't tell you what colour each number is. You're allowed to choose which colour you want to do. And I'd be very interested to see if there's different versions of that one to see what they all look like using different colours for the numbers. But we're turning now to our Bible readings, uh, our first Bible reading, which is from Matthew chapter 21, beginning at verse 23. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. They asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. He continued, what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds 
and believe him. Amen. And I'm going to hand over now to uh, to Deborah for a reflection on that reading. And hopefully Deborah will unmute herself and then we'll be able to hear her as well. Ah, there we go. It's all right. It, the button didn't want to work. <laughs> Mind you, about half an hour ago, the wind was blowing so much outside our house that the internet connection kept dropping in and out. So this could be a very, very short reflection if the wind picks up again. Um, don't start praying for that. So by what authority and who gives you this authority is the question that I'm thinking about. It's a question that I've asked myself so often from the very first time I got into a pulpit to preach to beginning my training to ordained ministry, to actually being ordained, I kept thinking, somebody's gonna say no, shouldn't be her, to taking on the role of a superintendent, and more recently, the assistant chair. By what authority and who gives this authority? I have always believed that calling came from God. It was then tested and affirmed by the courts of the church, beginning at the local level through the church council, then at the circuit level with local preachers meetings and circuit meeting, then by the district and connectional bodies. It was tested by training institutes and peers, and it continues to be tested on a regular basis. But even with a deep sense of call, the testing and the training, I still question by what authority? Every time there is a baptism, confirmation, a covenant service, recognition service, ordination, or welcome into a circuit service. The words that are spoken about God, our place within God's realm, the call on our lives to live in accordance with God's will, following the example of Jesus. The words strike me over and over again, as I'm sure it does for countless others. The doubts about our capacity, capability, the rightness for the role, they're all there. Sometimes I would even go as far as describing myself of having imposter syndrome. Did you really mean me? However, this past week I've realized there was one lady for whom I would say the opposite was true. Not that she was conceited, but she knew that she had the intellect, the capacity, the training to be a lawyer. Yet she always had to prove herself, not to herself, but to others. As the question, by what authority do you think you can apply for this role? You are a mere woman. You should be at home looking after your husband, helping him to get through law school. You should be at home looking after your children. And the litany of reasons why she shouldn't be what she believed she could be never went away. Until August the 10th, 1993, at the instruction of President Jimmy Carter, Ruth Bader Ginsburg became the first Jewish female and the second female to serve in the Supreme Court. This week, her life and work have been honoured as she became the first Jewish female to lay in state. A remarkable woman who used the authority and position of power vested in her intelligently, wisely, as she campaigned throughout her career against many things, but most notably inequality and particularly gender inequality. And we give thanks for her life and for the people who have followed because of all that she has made possible. A bit closer to home, by what authority? People are now challenging Boris. By what authority do you make these decisions? He is damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. If he opens businesses, colleges, schools, he is potentially flooding the NHS with C19 cases and everything he tried to slow down in March will be for nothing. However, if he goes back to closing everything down, then in economic terms, he is probably pushing the self-destruct button. What will happen then will be a massive decrease in jobs. The job losses will be exponential. Businesses will go to the wall. People's mental health will suffer. 
all this, just as the COVID battle is raging, there are other battles raging in Parliament too. So whether you like him or not, whether you support his brand of politics or not, whether you think he's a blundering buffoon, or perhaps smarter than we think, which of you would want to be in his job? Which of you would want to have that position of authority within government right now, right here in this moment? The authority invested in him comes from his local constituents. <coughs> within his own party, there were people who affirmed his desire to be PM. Then when we vote to the public, voted for him and his particular party. So his mandate to be and to do has been given to him by the people. He too has people from all parties, thank you, constantly trying to trip him up. Everyone from his own back benches to members of the opposition party, every journalist wanting to make a name for themselves. They're all throwing questions at him, trying to trip him up. What is at stake if he makes the wrong decisions? Quite simply, the lives of human beings, the economy, our relationship with the various jurisdictions within the UK, our integrity within Europe, and our place within the international corridors of power. Not much. His authority has been diminished because various people within his party structures, including himself, have made errors of judgment. They have told the population what they must do, and then they were caught breaking those rules. They made excuses for their actions, not once apologising. And when you lose the trust of the people, then you lose your authority over others. And he succeeded in doing just that, which makes it so difficult for us to take seriously whatever rules he throws at us on a daily basis, even when we know those rules are probably for the benefit of others and us. But go back 2000 years and here we see and hear of a man who is not self-seeking, neither did he seek to abuse his authority. In fact, as an itinerant preacher, what authority did he have? Yet he knew that his authority came deep from within, a power that could not be contained. In fact, to contain it, would be to do an injustice to those around him and to the one who called him. He too had people challenging, trying to chip him up. The people who are doing this are those who believe that they have the power. They are the ones in control. The chief priests, the senior rabbis, the elders of the faith community. And why is he challenging them? Or why and why are they challenging him? because he is disrupting the status quo. Not because he's changing rules and regulations, but because he is living within and by the rules of God. The rules that say, love one another, take care of the widow and the orphan, ensure that those who live among you have food to eat, water to drink and clothes upon their back. All those people who have been excluded respond to his message to his lifestyle, to his touch, to the advice he's giving, to the ways he answers the difficult questions. They are responding to the integrity with which he does everything. He sets an example that is exemplary. Here is a leader, a rabbi, a teacher, that they can put their trust in because it feels as though he cares for them. And in turn, they follow him. They want to learn more from this man. It doesn't matter what faith we profess, if we don't live in accordance with the ethos of that faith. If we, press, if we profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, the one whose name we carry, but actually everything we do is counter to his teaching, then no one is going to want to join us. No one is going to want to believe us and by inference believe in Jesus. All of us are called by Christ. All of us who describe ourselves as Christian have been gifted an authority, a power to live lives that not only honour God, but that also honours the life of all people and all creation. That should shape the way we spend our money, the charities we support, the people we stand up for, the words that we speak and the way that we say them. 
the love that we show not just to those who are like us, but to those who repel us, to those that need us and need to know that someone cares for them. The help we offer, the choices we make, all of these should be evidence of the fact that the authority by which we do these things is of Christ. An authority that has been affirmed by millennia of other Christians, tested and tried out by them and by us as the best way of living. A way that speaks of justice, peace and love. A way that has rules, but the rules that are there are for the benefit of the majority for all people, for all creation, if only we could but follow them. By the grace of God, may we learn to live in such a way that people are challenged to ask the difficult questions about why we do what we do and who we think that we are. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Deborah. And I just want to say that the Methodist Church, this circuit, myself, all of us would be less if it weren't for you and your acceptance of the authority that the church has placed in you, that you have followed in your life. We thank you for you, for your ministry. Uh, Deborah is on holiday for the next 10 days. So um, don't try and get in touch with her because she won't be there. Um, and and uh, but we do hope you have a good break and uh, spend some good time. So thank you, Deborah. We turn then to uh, our second reading, which is from Philippians. Um, after this, we have a reflection from Jonathan Gravestock and then a hymn, after which we'll see if there are any comments and questions uh, for Deborah or for Jonathan um, on this whole subject of authority. And as uh, Jonathan has loosely entitled his piece, Acquiring Divine Attitude. And his reflection is based on this reading from the letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Amen. And so we turn now to Jonathan. Good morning. Today's lectionary readings seem to highlight the importance of our attitude towards divine authority. To show attitude is often used as a negative description of people, 
the Pharisees probably thought Jesus displayed attitude. But attitude can be good as well as bad and can even be divine, depending on your viewpoint. And I believe divine attitude helps us to live as well as possible. The passage we've just heard from Paul's letter to the Philippians is particularly helpful in understanding divine attitude. Though Paul doesn't mention the word attitude, he describes how we should share Christ's nature of encouragement, comfort, fellowship, and compassion with one another and how having these gifts in common unites us. He also says we should avoid negative attitudes like ambition and vanity, opting instead for humility and empathy. Paul proceeds to outline Christ's example, his decline of divine status in favor of offering his life in God's service, a supreme example of divine attitude. The passage we heard today concludes with these words. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Paul was writing from prison, so he was unable to visit the church at Philippi. But undaunted, he humbly took the attitude that he was just the servant and his readers should obey God, not him. A more contemporary prisoner, Viktor Frankl, wrote in his book, The Meaning of Life, about his, his experience of being close to death in a concentration camp and realizing that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Similarly, Nelson Mandela was inspired to endure his long imprisonment stoically by the poem Invictus, which means unconquered. That poem includes this sentence. How charged with punishments, the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. It was written by the poet William Ernest Henley after years of painful TB infection of his bones. These men bore witness to a powerful attitude, yet Paul's letter said to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We know from his letter to the Romans that he believed salvation was achieved through faith, not work. So Paul's emphasis was on working out in the sense of solving problems. And while fear and power may seem strange companions, consider how powerful Christ was, who feared only God. If we trust God to control our lives, we can then approach all other challenges confidently, like Christ. And we certainly have no shortage of problems, such as COVID-19, loss of liberty and social contacts, loneliness, confusing statistics, economic debt, bankruptcy, unemployment, poverty, inequality, international disagreement, mass migration, global exploitation and warming, to name but a few. In fact, we may need to limit our exposure to the news to avoid feeling overwhelmed by it all. Yet, we can find comfort and strength to face all our problems through the power of our Lord's divine attitude of humility and obedience. It's no coincidence that Comforter was the name given by Christ to the Holy Spirit, his spiritual legacy through which we embody his attitude. My tutor was a local preacher, Bob Hinton, who's been a preacher for over 60 years, has recently felt that a spiritual revival may not only be needed, but near. And among the signs he sees is Richard Rohr's Centre for Action and Contemplation, which sends out free daily emails. In last Wednesday's contribution from Adam Bucko, entitled An Interspiritual Awakening, was this sentence. 
I don't think of the rise of the spiritual but not religious among our youth as a sign of spiritual decline, but rather a new kind of spiritual awakening. For me, this is divine attitude, requiring humility to accept that the Holy Spirit may be found among all religions and none, and it provides comfort and hope. There are new examples of divine attitude all around us, if only we are awake to them. One was sent to us in the Brighton and Hove Interfaith Contact Group by Ashwin of the equivalent group in Crawley the other day. It was a YouTube tribute to a man called Sean Stevenson who died last year. He had a genetic condition that prevented his bones from growing long and strong and which caused him much suffering. Yet his attitude to life was amazing. I recommend you to search for him as a source of laughter and inspiration and one more sign of the good news that love is all around and among us. And so I pray that heavenly attitude may be given to us all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. Can you just remind us of the name uh, of the man you just mentioned that Ashwin has spoken of? Sean Stevenson, S-A-U-N, and Stevenson spelt with a V. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. And one of the things that we're glad of is that uh, you too have accepted uh, that role, that call from God and the authority that comes with it as the Methodist Church seeks to recognise you and accredit you as a local preacher on full plan. And for those of you, as an advanced warning, just to say that on the first Sunday of November, we are going to be having the accreditation service online for Jonathan as a local preacher. And uh, we have the great joy in that service of a previous minister coming back to share with us in worship. And the Reverend Kathleen Allen is going to come and be part of that service on that day. And so we look forward to that very special occasion for Jonathan and hope that you will all join us on that day to celebrate with him. We're going to sing uh, a song now that speaks uh, of that divine compassion and that need for that to be in our hearts in the way that we respond to life and the way that we try and have the Lord's heart, if you like, as our heart, a heart of compassion. And so we're going to sing, teach me to dance to the beat of your heart. There we go. Okay, okay. Thank you. So uh, I invite then any comments or any questions from you um, to either Deborah or to Jonathan or just generally to us all uh, about those things that were um, that were spoken of um, about authority and divine attitude. So if anyone would like to make a comment, then please do put a C in the chat box or unmute yourself and um, and speak as you feel. Yes, Paul or Sue? Oh, it's both of us, really. Um, thank, you. thank you for this morning, everyone that's spoken. It's been really good. Um, one thing that sort of crossed my mind, and maybe I've misunderstood what's being said, is that um, you're saying about obeying and that sort of thing, but Jesus very much encourages people to find their own answers. When when you ask, when he was asked a question, he very often answered with another question. So, whilst I understand about obeying, are we not also to find our own way within those? So, Deborah or Jonathan, do you want to do you want to start with something? Um, as as you were the speakers, yes, Deborah. I'm quite happy to have a have a go at that. Um, actually, I, I didn't talk so much about obeying, but authority and and learning really as you go through what that looks like. So, for me, it's much more about testing your understanding of something. So, when Jesus answered with a question. Basically, he was asking them to test their understanding and to, to, to reconsider what it is they thought they believed. Um, 
so it's not really black and white. I think our gospel is not black and white. There are lots and lots of grey areas when we come to live it out. So for me, it's very much testing, which is why I also think that the the courts, the church courts, you know, are various levels of authority um, that are both lay led and ordain led are really important um, so that we together come to a, a mind about a, the direction of travel, maybe for the church, the decisions that we make, the way that we make those decisions. Um, and I would much rather have people with a questioning faith who are looking, you know, to understand better than people who might just take things at face value. So that's my kind of, of, of take on that whole business about obeying. We still have one, one rule to follow, which is to love. Can I have a word yes. as well? Thank you. Certainly. Yeah, I, I think for me, this is what Paul meant when he was talking about working out our salvation. As I say, he knows the problems are there. It, it's our attitude towards them that counts. And the attitude of Christ was critical. You certainly criticised the current authorities, but it was constructive too. And above all, it was caring, as Deborah said, it was it showed the love of God. So it's up to each of us not to avoid the problems, but to do so with the strength of God's love. Thank you both. That's helpful. I, th I think it is. And we live in very challenging times and what it means to love one another actually as we know, can come to different decisions on, the, on, on various things, you know. I mean, the whole debate around abortion, for instance, you know, what, what is loving in, in, in those situations? It, it becomes very tricky. And yeah, I think as Jonathan was saying, and as Deborah was saying, working it out and in a sense, having examples, if you like it, that are given to us of, you know, maybe here's something that tells us something about what our attitude should be. Um, and we might not always get it right for the other person, but we do it with our heart of compassion. And, and for me, I think um, if, we, if we are to be judged, uh, I shall say, then I think we're judged on where our heart is, what our motivation has been, whether, that's, whether we're motivated by love and a deep love for people and a deep compassion, um, even if that might bring us to different places and different answers. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think that was a really, really good question for us this morning. Anyone else with a question or a comment before we move into a time of prayer? No. Okay, well, we're going to move then to a time of prayer and um we've we've heard in jonathan's kind of um talk of the many many different areas of of concern and worry um that we have around the world and, and in this country too and we know too of our own concerns in our own lives and many people many situations that we ought to pray for so i do invite you to use the chat box uh, um, to write down your prayers for yourselves, for others, for our world at this time. Um, please do remember students um, coming to start new university courses and into a very different situation than they would have been envisaging um, six, seven months ago, as well as returning students who are finding it very strange, I, I would imagine, and the chaplaincy teams and Sue, Cynthia and Dan, especially amongst that, um, with the difficulties of working out how best to connect with students uh, at this time of year. So um, that should be in our prayers as well as our leaders, as Deborah has um, kind of questioned or, or, or pointed out to us who need our prayers. Uh, and yeah, uh, I, I always say that I would never be, if I was a politician, I would never be in government because I would always be in opposition um, about something. So uh, I, I would never want to be in their places, in their shoes. So lots of things for us to pray about and um, to aid us in our prayers, we're going to be listening to a song uh, by Elisa Turner called My Prayer For You. And so we share in that prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father, 
who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. A reminder that uh, with the link for this service and all the activity sheets, there was a link for another service, which is tonight at 6.30. We have a, another service, which is a prayer and meditation service being led by Deep Team Amasi. So uh, we invite you to join us with that. And there is a link to uh, that, a Zoom link um, for this evening's service. So it would be good to see many of you there as we pray for ourselves, for the world, for those we know. Okay, then we'll turn then to our final hymn this morning. Uh, and our final hymn talks again about that divine attitude that we should have, that we need to have. It's, may the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. It's number 504 in Singing the Faith. Some words from Charles Wesley. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free, a heart that always feels thy blood so freely spilt for me, a heart in every thought renewed and full of love divine, perfect and right and pure and good, a copy, Lord, of thine. Thy nature, gracious Lord, impart, come quickly from above, Write thy new name upon my heart, thy new best name of love. So may the blessing of God be with each one of us, and may we be a blessing to each other and to all who we meet. In the name of the Christ, light of the world. Amen.